Hey everybody, welcome! We're glad that you are joining us here on the online space of the Pathways Church community. My name is Nick, and uh, it has been a pretty scorching week here in the Pacific Northwest. It's been pretty sunny and hot. Uh, it's cooled down a bit for the weekend, which is nice, but hopefully you've been staying cool uh, wherever you are. I know it's been a really warm summer all around the country, and there's some of you uh, who uh, connect with us here in this online space from all different regions of this country, and we want to welcome you. Uh, here in this space today, we are going to continue in on our series on Psalms. We're going to be talking about a kind of an interesting Psalm here today, but before we get to all that, uh, let's just kind of introduce ourselves to those of you who may be new to this particular forum. Uh, this is the Pathways Church community. Uh, we meet in person in Mill Creek, Washington or Everett, I guess, kind of where it, it merges together. And we meet online right here. And I know that there's some of you that this is sort of your whole church experience. And so we want to welcome you uh, to being here with us. Now, if this is your first time meeting this group and uh, your first time kind of tuning into this whole thing, uh, we give you a little snapshot of who we are we, by listing our core values in the bottom of the screen here. Uh, these are things that we as a group of people have decided uh, on our journey together that we want to value. We want to slow down and realize that there is some value in some of these things or at least value in what God wants to teach us through these things. And so uh, if you want to know a little bit more about what we mean by these words listed in the corner of the screen, uh, you can go to our website at findpathways.com and uh, we give a little bit more verbiage to them there. And I know it's not quite like meeting people in person, but online uh, maybe you can get a sense of what type of group we are by the words that we use and the ways that we uh, describe ourselves. Now, a way that we often describe ourselves is with the two words cautious and curious. Just got a chance to explain this to someone in person again this week. Uh, we are cautious because many of us have grown up uh, surrounded by religion or in religious environments, and we've seen religion used in some ways that are really good and positive and helpful and, and beautiful, frankly. And uh, we know that religion can be used in a good way, but we've also seen religion used in ways that is harmful, hurtful, abusive, exclusionary, and uh, sometimes uh, used to prop up power and increase greed. And so we find ourselves being a little skeptical or at least cautious of organized religion. And I know that's weird because we are sort of an organized group of religious folks who are also a little bit uh, skeptical about organized religion. But that's just sort of the tension that we live in and we think that maybe that's a healthy space for organized religion uh, to always be a little cautious of itself uh, because religion can go off the rails pretty quickly. So that's cautious. The curious part is that we are a group that likes to ask a lot of questions. We like to ask questions about things that we don't know. Sometimes people feel afraid to ask questions when they don't know something, and we try to create an atmosphere atmosphere here where it's okay to question, ask questions about things that you don't know, to raise your hand and be like, hey, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about there. I don't know what this custom is here in your group. Can you please help me understand it? But it's not just uh, asking questions about things that we don't know. We also try to create an atmosphere where we're always asking questions about things that we think we do know. Because it turns out that there are a lot of things that have been handed down to us that we believe or ways of thinking that sometimes we never question. And as a group, we think it's perfectly acceptable. In fact, that it is part of being a responsible follower of Jesus to question things that have been handed down to us, things that we think that we know. Uh, so oftentimes there are beliefs or ways of thinking handed down to us and we will question them. We'll say, hmm, does that really work? Is that really true? Uh, was it true back then? But maybe we need something new now. And sometimes we question those things and we end up right back where we started. And other times we say, no, I think maybe we need to rethink that. So this is a group uh, that we ask a lot of questions and if either of those two words, cautious or curious, resonates with you, then this might be a really good group for you. Now, what we're going to be doing here in the next few moments, uh, this is a worship service for those of you who are online. Many of you tune in because this is your worship service each week. This is your church. And so what we're going to be doing is sort of churchy things. So over the next few minutes, Billy, our worship leader, is going to come on screen. He's going to lead us in two songs and sandwiched between those two songs is a uh, reflective video in the Psalms, because that's a series that we're in right now. And then after Billy gets done uh, with the music, I'm gonna come back on screen. There'll be a little bumper video to get us thinking, and then I'm gonna come back on screen and, uh, screen and talk about the Psalms today. And then when I'm done, I'm gonna lead us into a time of communion. 
Now, communion is something that we do every week. In our in-person gathering, we supply the bread and the cup for you. But here in the online space, if you would like to participate in communion, you'll need to gather those things for yourselves. And uh, there's nothing magical about the items that we uh, procure for the in-person gathering. Uh, so whatever you have at home will work. So if you've got a cracker or a piece of bread, that'll work for the bread. Uh, if you've got some juice or maybe uh, some wine left over from last night, uh, you can pull, pull that out and uh, do that at any time. And then at the end of our time together, if you'd like to participate in communion, uh, you're welcome to do that. Okay. That is pretty much everything that we're going to be doing here today. Uh, so why don't we just get right to it. Billy's going to lead us in a couple songs, and then I'll see you back here on the screen in a few moments. Okay, see you in a bit.
What would be one good thing about the Psalms for people who have no Christian faith? Not interested in the Bible, but they happen to read the Psalms. What would be one good thing that they would discover? Psalm 82, mm-hmm. it's a good start. Mm-hmm. Defend the rights of the poor and the orphans. Mm-hmm. Be fair to the needy and helpless. Rescue them from the power of evil people. See, this isn't charity, this is justice. Mm-hmm. Sure. Isn't it incredible that Jesus starts with his, you know, his mission, mm-hmm. the year of our Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee. Give sight to the blind. Mm -hmm. It's injustice. It's not charity. And I love that the Psalms have that. In Psalm 9, God remembers those who suffer. The Lord is the refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold for those in trouble. And Psalm 12, Mm. actually this is very interesting. Mm. I will come because the needy are oppressed and the persecuted groan in pain. Mm. I will give them the security they long for. This is Christ. This is, Mm. I will come because the needy are oppressed. Mm. It is the reason, and of course, um, Christ uh, quoting Isaiah, sets out his manifesto. And it better be our manifesto. Because if it's not our manifesto, yeah. then we're then we're on. We've some other strain. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so I just love that that's even in the Psalms. I love that. That's Bono there, and uh, he starts off being asked the question: If you are unfamiliar with the Psalms, where do you start? And Bono leads out right with Psalm eighty-two, which is a psalm that we are actually even going to look at today. And he said, you don't know anything about Psalms, you just start with Psalm 82. And he says, because it's all about justice. And he says, that's what matters most. And he goes on to say that it's even what matters most to Jesus is the idea of justice. And I love Bono's perspective. It's fun uh, hearing the perspective of Bono. He's not a Bible scholar. He's obviously a musician, an artist. But it's fun to hear his perspective on the Psalms, which are in large part art. 
and uh, maybe even some sort of music or songs. You know, love hearing new perspectives. Uh, movies sometimes give you new perspectives, don't they? Uh, I've been to the movie theater twice in the last month, and that is unusual because I hadn't been in a movie theater in over five years, or about five years, uh, because, I don't know, you can just watch everything at home, and it's just comfortable. But two good movies got me out to the theater in the last month. Uh, Mission Impossible and Barbie both came out, and I was excited to go. And I love both those movies. I especially uh, appreciated Barbie because it just gives you a new perspective. What is life like from the perspective of this doll who thought she was bringing so much uh, women's empowerment into the world? And uh, what do things actually look like in the real world when she gets a new perspective? And the whole movie is sort of giving us a new perspective, and I just thought it was well done. A uh, fantastic movie overall. But I remember another movie that kind of illustrates a new perspective that came out back in the 1980s. In fact, maybe it was 1980. Uh, I, don't, I didn't see it in the theater. I was just a little too young. But it was a movie called The Gods Must Be Crazy. Anybody see this one? Uh, it's an old classic movie, and uh, it's still probably pretty funny. Uh, but The Gods Must Be Crazy is this little story where a Coke bottle falls out of the sky uh, in on top of the head of a... Uh, kind of a primitive tribal person in Africa. And as viewers, we know that the bottle was thrown out of an airplane by an airplane pilot. But the tribal people uh, don't know this. They're unaware of airplanes. And so they assume that the bottle is a gift from the gods, right? I mean, it came from the sky. So where else could it possibly have come from? And they don't even know what a Coke bottle is. And so this mysterious object has arrived. And uh, and they assume it must be from their gods. Now, they find that there must be some uses for this thing, and they find all sorts of creative uses, but the problem is there's only one bottle, and not nearly enough to go around for everyone in the tribe to use it, and so it causes conflict, and so the movie is about how one guy in the tribe goes to throw it off the edge of the world, because perhaps this gift from the gods, this empty Coke bottle, is actually a bit of a curse. Now, you say, well, that's a weird explanation for the appearance of a Coke bottle, and to us, that's true, but not to them. This was some mysterious object they'd never seen before that fell out of the sky, and so the only real possible explanation was that it must have come from the gods. From their perspective, that was the only real explanation. And that's what we want to talk about here a bit today, is perspective. Because lots of the what we read in the Bible forces us to think from a different perspective. We have to get out of our own head, our own way of seeing things, and see and read with the mindset of an ancient person. To understand a lot of the Bible, and uh, particularly a lot of the Psalms that we're looking at in our series here, we need to think a lot more like the tribe from that old movie and less like people from our own time. We're doing a series here called the Psalms Playlist, and we are studying uh, that most beloved uh, collection in the center of your paper Bibles called the Book of Psalms. And it is a true compilation. It's a compilation of 150 curated and carefully organized compositions. Some of them appear to be uh, just poems, poetry. Some appear to be prayers that individuals prayed. Sometimes whole groups of people prayed together. Some of them appear to be songs or at least have something to do with music. Uh, some of them we think are litanies or liturgies. They're kind of responsive readings that when uh, the people of Israel would come together in worship that they would read them back and forth together as a part of their worship. Uh, but uh, as diverse as they are, really, none of them are written from our perspective. And that's probably the most important thing to keep in mind. These were written by people who had a very different view of how the world and God worked. And all of these compositions are written from their perspective, not yours, and not mine. And so what they do, what these psalms do, is they preserve how people thought and what they believed about how God and nature worked back then. And it was it is very different from ours. And so we need to know that as we go into our psalm today. Now, our psalm today is the one that Bono referenced, Psalm 82. It's a fascinating psalm. There's been lots of scholarly discussion about Psalm 82. Uh, and it's really, really interesting uh, for our purposes here as we're discovering how to read things from an ancient perspective because there's pers some perspectives in here that are very different than our own, okay? So let's start by reading Psalm 82. We're just going to read it together on the screen. 
screen here or if you have your own Bible and you want to check you know, to make sure it's the same as on the screen, you're welcome to do that. But let's start by reading it and then we'll notice some of the perspectives that are a little different than ours that are within this particular composition. Now, it's only eight verses long. It's rather short, so let's read it together. Psalm 82 verse 1 starts with the title, A Psalm of Asaph. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Salah, which just means probably to pause, to reflect. Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High. Die, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. Okay, so short psalm, only eight verses. It's attributed and entitled to a person named Asaph. And Asaph was a Levite who established a guild of singers in the temple. So perhaps Psalm 82 is a song, which would be fitting for Bono to comment on it because uh, Bono himself is a songwriter and it appears that this was written by a songwriter as well. Now, we know that just because someone's name is in the title doesn't mean that the person actually wrote it. So did Asaph actually write this psalm? Well, we don't really know. Maybe he did, or maybe it was penned by someone in the singing guild that he created and so his name got attached to it. But either way, whoever wrote this, it contains some very interesting perspectives that are a little bit different than our modern assumptions, okay? So I want to point out a couple of these today, just a few. I've got three um, important differences in perspectives that they had uh, that Asaph or his singing guild or whoever penned this thing had that are different than our own. And the first perspective is simply this that there are many gods, but Yahweh is the best of them. All right, now we've seen this before in many times in our other series, but this is a really good place to point it out again. And uh, I always think it's worth slowing down and mentioning some of these things more than one time, uh, because then we say, oh yeah, that pops up here and there and there. Oh, I didn't realize that was um, uh, happening so often in the Bible material. And this is one of those things that we need to point out again today, because the authors of this material aren't always monotheists. Whoa, what? Monotheists. You remember what that believes? Uh, you, what that means? It means that you believe in one God, that there aren't any other gods out there. There's only one God. Uh, I am a monotheist. I think there's only one God. But it appears in Israel's history that they weren't always monotheists, that they were probably more accurately described as monolatrous. And what monolatrists believe is that there are in fact many gods, but there is only one who is worthy of worship. And that might seem weird to us, but not to them because the ancient world was actually awash with different gods. Each people group, each nation, each country, or sometimes just even regions within countries had their own gods who were responsible for all sorts of things like protection and sustenance, making the crops grow and have enough food, right? Uh, they were uh, responsible for procreation, that kids would be born. They were responsible for the weather, right? That it would rain occasionally so the crops could grow. All sorts of things. And nobody really questioned this in the ancient world. There wasn't science like we have today with weather patterns and all of that, you know, to explain why these things happen. So they all assumed that the gods, multiple gods, were responsible for this. And it appears that the early Israelites were no exception. They don't seem to challenge this idea that there are multiple gods. What they simply believe is that their God was greater. Their God, Yahweh, is more powerful, he is worthy of worship, and that he is the only one you should worship. And we see this, though, that they believe in these multiple gods with their God uh, being the greatest of them all in lots of language in the Psalms, not just here in Psalm 82. For instance, here's some other places we see it. Psalm 86 verse 8. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord. There are nor are there any works like yours. Here's Psalm 95 verse 3. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Okay? 
Here we go. Psalm 96, verse 4. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, he is to be revered above all gods. Okay? Psalm 97, verse 7 and verse 9. All servants of images are put to shame, those who make their boasts in worthless idols. All gods bow down before him. And verse 9. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Psalm 135, verse 5. For I know that the Lord is great. Our Lord is above all gods. Okay, you get it? I mean, there's quite a bit of this language in the Psalms. And you can say, well, it's just a poetic way of saying that God is, is great. Uh, but no, that's we're only assuming that because of our modern perspective that there only is one God. Uh, but that is not the case with the ancient Israelites. It appears that they believe that there are, in fact, many gods, but their God is the most dominant, the most powerful, and uh, the one who is truly worthy of worship. Now, those examples are just some of the many gods language that we find in the Old Testament. Uh, obviously not just in the Psalms. We have seen it elsewhere. A great reminder of this is the ten plagues of Exodus. Now, you remember Moses shows up. Pharaoh won't let the people go. So uh, God helps him throw out these plagues to finally convince Pharaoh to let them go. Now, the ten plagues aren't just random plagues, though. Each plague is actually targeting an Egyptian god, demonstrating that Yahweh has power over the thing that the Egyptians believed there was a special god to control. And so this whole demonstration of the ten plagues it isn't really saying that there aren't any other gods. It's just demonstrating that Yahweh is more powerful than the gods of Egypt. And this is something we see play out all throughout Israel's history. Now, Israel does eventually become monotheistic, but they don't start that way. And as we encounter a lot of this material in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, we discover that they are a group of people that is believing there are many gods. Now, I want to stop right there and just say that acknowledging that ancient Israel believed in many gods does not mean that we need to, okay? I don't. I, I'm a monotheist. And later, Israel didn't believe that either. But it's part of stepping into the world of the composers of this material because we have to meet them uh, really on their footing in their perspective. Now that leads us to the second perspective here, and this is kind of a weird one. It's the divine council, okay? And this one kind of flows from the first one because not only did the ancient people believe in many gods, but they also believed that these gods got together in a hierarchical uh, like kind of ruling body, that they came together and made decisions together, that there was a council, or you could even think of it as a a boardroom of the gods that met together, uh, made up of lesser gods and one god who was sort of in control, the highest god, who was the one ruling over the boardroom. Now, the highest ruler, the high ruler of this divine council in the region of Israel was given a specific name, the name El Elyon. And you may have heard this name because we have sung it in many Christian songs over the years. I believe it's in the song El Shaddai. El Elyon is in there, and what it means is God Most High. It's actually a Canaanite name. It didn't even originate with Israel. It just means the God Most High, and it's referencing the highest God in the Canaanite, uh, the pre-Kind of Jewish religion, right? Uh, it is the, their highest God in their idea of the divine council room. That all these gods got together, and El Elyon was the most powerful God who kind of kept all the lesser gods in order. And so Israel comes along and doesn't say, "Oh, that whole idea of El Elyon and the divine council isn't really true." They just said, "Oh yeah, it's Yahweh, our God, who is actually El Elyon," and started using that name for Yahweh at times. Now. You say, that's bizarre. That is really weird. And you're right. It is weird for us, but not for them. And that is actually the picture of what is happening in Psalm 82. In Psalm 82, the divine council of the gods is meeting. It's the whole point of Psalm 82. Look at this. It's how it starts. Psalm 82 verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment. Okay, so this whole psalm starts out uh, with a setting, and the setting is that Yahweh is El Elyon meeting 
with the lesser gods. And he is in the boardroom where these decisions are made and he's controlling the lesser gods. He's like, that is so weird. That's actually in the Bible? Uh, yes, and that is what this psalm, it's the picture that this psalm is painting. That's the picture uh, or the perspective that this artist has about how things work. Now, before you think, well, that's weird, um, uh, you know, that must be a one-off in the Bible. It's really not. You remember, uh, we get the same picture in the book of Job. You remember that story, this man named Job? Uh, Job's life goes from really, really good, blessed, has everything, he's wealthy, big family, everything's going great, to really, really bad. He loses everything, right? And the story, before all of everything happens, before he has this great reversal, the story gives us a behind-the-scene look at the beginning that explains why Job's life is going to become so awful. And uh, the whole story of Job appears to be an ancient attempt to address why bad things happen to otherwise good people. Why do these calamities suddenly happen? Well, there must have been a reason. And so the setting it gives us as the reader, the viewer, before we get into the story of Job, is this specific scene. And this scene happens in the divine council. The opening of Job is God in the divine council, in a courtroom, the divine council is meeting, and one of these lesser deities in the council called the accuser, which in Hebrew is the Satan. Uh, we, later on, tradition makes Satan, the Satan, into Satan as an actual character. But at this point in Hebrew, it doesn't really mean that. It's just, it's not even a proper name. It's not like the name of a person, Satan. It's just a title like prosecuting attorney. And so it's called the accuser. And so he comes and Yahweh sets up a wager about this servant Job and his character. So Job 1, uh, verse 6, One day the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord. Okay, that's the divine counsel. And the accuser... The Satan also came among them. The Lord said to the accuser, where have you come from? The accuser answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walk, walking up and down from it on it. The Lord said to the accuser, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Okay, this is the scene right before Job. We're in the divine courtroom here. Uh, Yahweh's holding court. The lesser deity comes in. He's wandering on the earth because he has some sort of authority, right? And God challenges him about his servant Job. And the accuser, after this part, says, oh, Job only loves you because you've given him a good life. You've given him everything that he ever wanted to. But if his life was full of hardship, he would curse you. He wouldn't like you the way he does today. And Yahweh says, well, you want to bet? And he gives, in the divine council here, because he's El Elyon with all the power, he gives this permission to the accuser, the lesser deity, to go do to Job whatever he wants to do to him as long as he doesn't kill him. And so it's the same divine council room picture. And all of Job is really illustrating a reason from the ancient perspective of why bad things sometimes happen to good people. There are things happening from their perspective in the divine council that we aren't aware of that affect our lives. And again, I'd just like to point out, I don't think this is how things really work. I don't think this is the reality of why bad things happen to good people. I don't think there's a divine council room with lesser gods and one God ruling over them. But the point is, ancient Israel did think this way. And we have to understand how they think and think like them in order to read the Bible. And then once we understand that, we can assess how that way of thinking may have changed and what and why we are to take from it. You get it? It's a different perspective. There's many gods and they all meet together in a big boardroom. <laughs> now that leaves us with the third perspective and that is the priority of justice. Because Psalm 82 is a song that illustrates a major priority of Israel mentioned over and over again, and that is the concept of justice. And that's exactly what Bono told us is the priority as well. If you don't know anything about the Psalms, where do you start? He said Psalm 82 because it's all about justice. And Israel believed that justice was a priority of religion. Now, in this Psalm, the lesser deities in that council room, in that boardroom, are on trial. They have actually been accused of something, and El Elyon is holding court uh, with them on trial. And what they've been accused of is that they have not been uh, upholding justice. They have not been just. 
They are letting those who take advantage of the poor and the vulnerable to get off free. They're standing by and they're watching the wicked abuse the innocent. And so the charge against them is corruption. Those who have been delegated authority over the earth haven't been doing what is right. And so the psalmist in this, what we think is a song, is crying out to God to set things right in the divine council so that things will be made right on earth. What he's asking for is for God to fire the entire boardroom of these lesser deities. He's saying the gods must be crazy. So let's get rid of them. Now, what we have seen, what we seem to have here is a judgment speech by God sandwiched between an opening and a closing statement of the author. And here is a really good picture of kind of how most scholars think that Psalm 82 lays out with two different voices, the narrator at the beginning and the narrator at the end, and God's speech in the courtroom sandwiched in the middle. Now the narrator starts out, God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. The narrator sets the case for us, then God proclaims his judgment on the lesser deities, and finally the narrator in verse 8 uh, kind of rounds out the whole thing in a nice poetic fashion, you know, start and end the same way, huge feature of uh, uh, Hebrew poetry. He ends it with, rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. The narrator is crying out for God to set things right. And he pictures Yahweh on his royal throne, judging those in the divine council, those in authority over this world, for their corruption, for aligning themselves with the powerful while the poor and the destitute go without. And God's judgment is to remove these lesser deities uh, from power, to remove those who are corrupt from power. And notice this. In verse 6 and 7, Yahweh is saying to these lesser gods, <coughs> excuse me, you, I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Wow. Some have said that this is actually even the transitional moment for Israel moving toward monotheism, monotheism, away from monolatry to monotheism, because here Yahweh is sentencing all the other gods to death. And now only Yahweh himself and his justice remains. Okay, so here we have a song with some pretty weird ideas. We've got multiple gods in a divine council, We've got Yahweh as El Elyon ruling over all of them. And Yahweh takes the lesser gods to court, to trial for being corrupt and not taking care of the poor. And ultimately, he removes them from power, sentencing them to death because they are corrupt. And that's kind of the gist of this psalm. Now, that's pretty weird imagery for us, for sure. Not a lot of sermons today are probably being preached about the divine council of deities and Yahweh ruling over them. It's weird imagery for sure. So what are we to do with it today? Well, it might resonate with us a little more than we initially think. Because I think the best place for us to focus in a psalm like Psalm 82 is on that last piece, justice. Because that's really the critical part of this whole psalm. You see, that's what the psalmist really cares about. The psalmist isn't trying to make a case for the fact that there are many gods and that Yahweh rules over them. No, that's not the point of the psalm. Uh, the psalmist already takes all that for granted. They assume everybody agrees on that. What the psalmist is really highlighting is that, uh, that God cares about justice. And that is where we get that beautiful statement that Bono referenced in the video to begin this in verse 3 and 4, where God says, Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. You see, these are God's words uh, to these lesser deities in the boardroom. But really, these words are still our commission today. We may not have divine councils today. We may not believe that there are a whole bunch of lesser gods in a boardroom who are pulling all the strings in life. But 
There are authorities in our world today in powerful positions. Sometimes they're so powerful, they almost feel like deities. Some of them, well, they got more money than God, we like to say. Sometimes they're corporate CEOs. Sometimes they're politicians. Sometimes they're judges. Sometimes they're national rulers. But sometimes these people in positions of authority sometimes seem to put corporate profits or campaign donations or ideologies or sometimes just even their own comfort over what is right for those with much less. And it makes us angry. We want to yell, fire them all! Get all these people out of here! It makes us angry, doesn't it? And it should make us angry. You see, in Psalm 82, we discover that God is on the side of those who are angry that justice is not done. We discover that a major part of Israel's religious life was justice. And it should be for us today. You see, for Israel, justice wasn't just some nice little addition that you could be interested in alongside of all your religious other duties of, you know, bringing tithes and singing and offering your prayers. In fact, justice was what God wanted more than all the other religious exercises. Justice had priority. It's why in Amos, God tells the people of Israel, away with all the noise of your assemblies, all your gatherings and your music and all that. I detest it, he says. Just get it all out of here. He says, but let justice flow like a mighty stream. You see, the priority for God isn't whether you get together and you worship and you sing songs and you pray a lot and you read your devotions and you you you, you do all the kind of religious uh, things. The priority for God is justice. And that should probably sink in. You see, you cannot follow Jesus and not care about justice. If your religion doesn't lead you toward working for more justice, well, then it's not the religion of Jesus, no matter what you call it. If your religion doesn't side with the poor over the rich and the powerful, well, That's not the religion God wants. In fact, as we discover in Psalm 82, it's that type of religion that God condemns and judges. He'd rather that type of religion just die. And so, we as followers of Jesus must work for justice. We work for it. We must act. We must be people who pursue justice, but we also pray for justice. Because sometimes we try to do what we can do, but sometimes it feels like nothing much changes. Sometimes it feels like the gods have just gone crazy. And that's how the psalmist feels. There's all these people in power in a divine boardroom somewhere that I can never get into. They're making all the decisions, and there's nothing I can do to bring justice. And so the psalmist here just feels completely helpless. And you can sympathize with that, right? Things don't change. And so he writes a song to cry out to God for help. He sings. For justice. He doesn't know what to do. So he turns to God and sings for God to bring justice. Now, that's not an excuse for inaction. We must pursue justice through our actions, but we should pray for it too. Pray that God would lead the way to justice. Let's pray for that today. God, we come to you today and we know that our world is, um, oh, well, in some ways we've, we've really advanced. We've become 
uh, more sensitive to certain things. We've progressed in many ways than the ancient culture that we are reading about today. But there's still plenty wrong with our world. There's still plenty of corruption. There's still plenty of injustice. There's still plenty of people who have a lot taking advantage of those who have not very much. And God, we pray today that you would help us be people who pursue justice. Um, Won't you help us to find the ways that we can deliver those who are in jeopardy, those who are vulnerable, those who are being taken advantage of. Won't you help us to find the ways that we can to participate in bringing justice and peace. But God, ultimately, there's a lot of things that happen that are outside of our control. There are people in boardrooms and people in all sorts of important places that make decisions that we will never have influence with. And so we pray, God, that you would step in and bring justice that you would inspire those who are in those places to bring justice. We know that one day you will come back, you will set everything right. And we wait for that day expectantly. Oh Lord, may it come. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to go to communion now. Uh, Billy's going to sing a song for us. And uh, you're welcome to take communion as we do that. We're just remembering the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus that... God, when he puts his mind to it, he overcomes death. And uh, that means that one day uh, he will overcome all that is wrong in this world. And we hold on to that hope. And so we take that communion, living in that power today. Uh, And then after Billy gets done leading that song, uh, I'll come back on the screen and I'll finish up with some announcements. Okay, let's go to communion. darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, Lord, turn lives around, I worship you, I worship you.
Stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Oh, that's great, Billy. Appreciate that. Uh, and we have a couple announcements as we wrap up here today. One major one uh, that we'll let you know here in a second. But before we do that, uh, those of you who uh, are online, if you would like to give and support the Pathways Church financially, you can do that by going to our website at findpathways.com slash donate. You can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. And uh, those of you who are online, this is a really great way to participate in the life of this church. Uh, we are on a mission to try to connect with people who have otherwise uh, probably decided to be done with church altogether. But hey, maybe I'll give this weird, quirky little church um, 
uh, one last try and there's a lot of people who maybe have needed to rethink some previous ways of thinking that have found a connection here with us and you can be a part of that by supporting us financially and so if you want to do that you can do that on the website uh, and we would love to have you partner with us in that way. Uh, okay, the big real announcement is uh, this week on Wednesday we are going to have a meeting at uh, the Zion Lutheran building. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the possibility at least of relocation. Uh, it'll be at 6.30 p.m. Wednesday uh, at the Zion Church uh, building. We wanted to meet right there in the building so we have a chance to just kind of uh, walk through it, uh, dream about some things, and talk about what that could mean for us. So uh, the Zion Church, they have invited us. They've formally invited us now to uh, come relocate and meet there in their building. Uh, the idea would be we'd just be kind of two different entities uh, meeting in the same space. We may share our worship services together, uh, but we'll continue to be two separate identities, but uh, using the same property and doing a lot of ministry together. And it turns out there's an incredible amount of things uh, that can be done in that neighborhood and might be some really neat possibilities and opportunities for us. So we wanna to get together this Wednesday and just talk about it. Um, I'll kind of share a little bit on Wednesday, uh, a little bit of some vision for what type of stuff could happen in that facility and uh, give a chance for everybody to talk a little bit about um, maybe what some of our excitements are, maybe even uh, some of our um, uh, reservations about it, I suppose. Uh, we want to give everyone a chance who's interested at least uh, to share a little bit about how they feel about it. And uh, we haven't formally accepted anything yet. We just uh, had received the, the invitation. So we thought, okay, now's a good time to get together and uh, really talk about where we want to be. So uh, if you want to show up on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., that would be great. Uh, if you can't make it to that, we'll probably have a meeting the following Sunday, uh, just right after church in our in-person gathering too, if you weren't able to make it Wednesday so you'd have a chance to uh, meet and talk a little bit then, okay? Uh, that's the major announcement. Uh, we are going to be doing our next Construction Zone series starting in the fall, probably uh, the beginning of October. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, sexuality, gender, same-sex relationships, all sorts of stuff there that we've been promising to talk about that topic for a while. So we'll finally get to that here in the fall. Okay, uh, also, if you want to get our newsletter and you don't receive that already, uh, you can uh, get information and uh, announcements through our newsletter. Uh, message us on Facebook with your name and email address or email me. My name is on the screen. Uh, my email is on the screen. And uh, just let us know that you want to be added to the email list and we'll be sure to do that. Okay, that's pretty much it. I think it's going to be cooler this week. I hope so. I've been sweating like crazy. So hopefully uh, it's a little bit cooler and uh, you have a really good week. And we will see you next time right back here. Okay, God bless you. Have a good week.